So uh, I, I am going to show some, some work that I've done previously because I know there's a lot of new people here that, haven't, that are not familiar with it so that there'll be a little bit of a review. And then uh, I, I'm going to uh, also show um, some new work and um, possibly, depending on gauging from your eyes, get into a little bit of an academic paper on philosophy and ecology, mostly looking at American platitudes and kind of uh, uh, dealing with issues of um, their value systems, which are basically Homer Simpson can kind of sum it all up. So how we can kind of communicate to the average American what may need to happen so that we could get over this energy crisis or climate crisis hump. So my thesis today is going to be something based on Paul Gilding, who was a former CEO of uh, Greenpeace, and uh, uh, Bill McKibben, who's written many books, one of them, The End of Nature. I think, I think the, the thesis is, is based on a very simple predicate, and we went over this with, in, with our seminars earlier, uh, well, I guess the last two days. But that simple predicate is that um, growth, actually in one word, growth is the, the major issue. Growth meaning that you'll never find a leader or a politician or an economy or a civilization that doesn't move underneath that single kind of directive. That is the overriding principle. And if we're expecting to have 9 billion people on the planet Earth uh, and, and the economy to double, we haven't recognized probably the second thing, which is the Earth is packed. The Earth is full. We get most of our resources from these kinds of externality costs, pull them in, and grow that economy. And I, and I unfortunately, I agree with uh, some of my other colleagues uh, that uh, I don't think growth is going to change, and I don't find it to be something that's specifically sustainable. It's inherent in who we are as a civilization. So if we are going to continuously grow, both in population and in economy, what does that mean? What would be the kind of uh, the, the long-term answer? And that, unfortunately, if the Earth is full, is uh, a bit of bad news. It kind of falls in the theories known as eschatology, or theories that deal with the apocalypse on some level. And I, I'm not here to, to promote any level of, of, of doom saying. In fact, I don't agree with doom saying. But I think that what the planet needs, or what civilization needs, is a really good crisis. And that crisis, and having a visceral understanding of that particular incident, will get the adrenaline flowing, will get society to kind of prompt itself to alter its attitudes and value systems, especially in America, and create some level of change. And that is not without precedent. So if you think in, in World War II, America was invaded by uh, the Japanese, uh, 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 and uh, it, almost overnight we had a collective agreement, a singular kind of conscious move in three days, actually, so it wasn't technically overnight, but three days we realigned our food systems, waste, energy, industry systems, all for a singular effort. So it took us three days to get our act together. It took a couple of months to retool some of the larger systems, but the principle was in place. That's because we, we had uh, a crisis. So if we had a, a crisis at the same scale with the same level of, of, of impact and drama, uh, uh, then I think we will probably get to what we've been talking about for the last 50 years. I mean, you've certainly been doing that research before. We have textbook understandings of the environmental debate. We have textbook kind of comprehension of what needs to happen for the next civilization. There's really nothing new that needs to be said. It's all there. The, the, the kind of the blueprint for civilization 2.0 uh, has existed for some time. It's actually been regurgitated since the 50s, uh, repeated again the 60s with much more vigor and a little bit of drugs, and then this probably a little bit in the 70s too. Uh, the 80s, it disappeared thanks to Reagan. Uh, 90s, it's back, and certainly in 2000, it seems to be the same repeat of the same texts and the same arguments. So whether it's uh, um, Illich or uh, Hershey or uh, Henry David Thoreau or, um, you know, uh, you name it, Bill McKibben, I think that the language and the kind of the directives are the same. It's gotten slightly more aggressive, but I think we're at the point now where we're done making it a kind of a foregrounded issue. I don't think we need to constantly promote uh, environmentalism up front. It just simply doesn't work. It doesn't convince most people, certainly Americans, to change their value systems. Homer Simpson, as an example, has been aware of it for some time. Frankly, he doesn't care. And that, that's maybe fine, because most Americans have other things that are more important to care about. Certainly Europeans and the rest of the world, Asians, uh, have things that are of more interest. 
education, housing, the economy, war and peace, sports. You know, there's probably at least 10 or 15, 20 things that are on the agenda of most humans than certainly the environment. That doesn't mean the rest of the planet, everything else that's sentient, all the flora and fauna might have that on their primary agenda, but we're having a very difficult time communicating to them. And they've certainly been sending us, sending us all kinds of signals. Uh, we've chosen not to listen to them. Uh, th this is, uh, let me just explain this image. This is a, a kind of a, a, a jump starting or a kick starting of coral reefs. Again, these are baby artificial reefs. This is a, a postdoc student in Georgia Tech that's beginning to kind of uh, uh, rebuild the marine ecosystem and do this kind of artificially. Um, and this is the Three Gorges Dam, kind of representation of the massive effects of industry and the scaling up of all kinds of technologies. And this, this harkens back actually to a specific book uh, that is a must read for pretty much everyone on the planet. Uh, it's, it's certainly been assigned everywhere in universities, but we talked about it a little in my seminar, which was uh, Hiroshima. So I, I think the environmental debate began at that exact point, at least as we understand it in a contemporaneous fashion. Hiroshima by John Hershey was uh, our first uh, deeper, this profound, actually profound connection to what happens when we erase everything that we know, everything that keeps us breathing and alive. And it was, uh, it was kind of after the Enola Gay had dropped uh, Fat Boy and obliterated hundreds of thousands of people, and we did it twice. It was a decision that uh, we made to kind of end the war and save lives, but no one knew what that meant. The newspapers recorded images of a before and after. You know, there was a, a city, and then there was an erasure, a grand kind of destructive act. And that, that certainly has a, a visceral impact. I think that if you can find semiotics, uh, that many people can connect with uh, this kind of disappearance or the erasure of an entire uh, uh, way of life. Um, but what didn't make the connection was the on-the-ground uh, interpretation and experience of, of what happened, at, uh, certainly at the environmental level and definitely on the human level, of the events in Hiroshima. And that was recorded uh, at a, in almost a journalistic-like uh, uh, stance by John Hershey when he went and almost immediately visited post-destruction uh, uh, Hiroshima, the kind of the original ground zero, uh, is where it's got its name from. And there, in kind of a, a, a detailed narrative, he unpacked inch by inch, the disaster that erased what we understand as life as we know it. All the stuff that composed everything that allows us to breathe and live was pretty much gone. And it starts off uh, someplace where he goes to the very center of the explosion and, and describes uh, oblivion, where people, uh, he, there was a, a woman with a baby carriage and a man on a ladder painting a roof, and he knew that that's what was there because they were, their bodies were obliterated to the point where they were reduced to shadow, melted into shadow, uh, uh, you know, 20 feet, 30 feet in length. So they, they, there was probably no pain. It was just instant obliteration. But there was a, a kind of a, a remnant, some level of their previous existence. Uh, and as he moves into the outer rings, kind of discovers the, the, the other, let me go to this drawing, the crisis. Uh, as he goes into the outer rings and discovers, you know, uh, destroyed uh, um, temples, uh, uh, houses leveled, uh, manufacturing plants uh, absolutely uh, turned to rubble and dust uh, of a description that never existed before. He started, get to, he started to get to the survivors. Uh, there were very little plants and other things that, were served, that did not make it, but there was, there was uh, some, some examples of people starving, you know, uh, 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 filled with fear, uh, blind, uh, and there was a, one particular moment uh, that I, I also was talking about before where he goes to a river where many people are either trying to drown themselves because of the severity of the pain or just the loss itself, but um, others were just trying to heal themselves, just get some cold water over their bodies that were burning from the disaster. And uh, there was a, a group of women um, Cry, Japanese woman crying, and he tried to go into the, the riverbank and help one of them out because she was just screaming for some kind of help. And in the, in the story, he describes that he grabbed her arm and, and pulled off her, her skin like a long glove, just disappeared, uh, and she sank back into the water and left that in the kind of the descriptive narrative. So uh, the book goes on, filled with uh, many details and horrors of what happened to human life and environmental life. And it stayed in the kind of imaginations 
and that, I guess this is the kind of crucial point, the imaginations of Americans, certainly Europeans, other, I mean, Asians already experienced it, I guess, here, but uh, we remembered that this destruction was the kind, as close as we're going to get to an apocalypse, and if it ever had uh, a real description, there it was. And it was that, that fear that, that led us to start thinking that energy systems, not just weapon systems, but energy systems derived from the atomic level, were also equally as dangerous and gave us that kind of input and uh, kind of um, negative uh, excitement when it came to thinking about these things as having anything to do with our civilization. I mean, if we, ca if we kind of project into more recent events, Fukushima has, to a lesser extent, but still has been effective kind of retooling and, and kind of uh, uh, kind of postscribing the events that happened already at Hiroshima. Clearly, it wasn't to that same extent, but the fear involved and the knowledge that was evoked at that point by John Hershey caused the Japanese government to uh, basically uh, begin the eradication of all nuclear power. Uh, it also led to Americans just cementing what we've already put in place, which is no more nuclear energy. Anyone knows anything about the environmental debate or certainly the energy crisis knows that uh, well, the, the math is difficult. There's more people, and more people want to live like this. Uh, you know, iPhones, laptops, cameras, lights, uh, tons of energy being used. Even if we get more efficient, there's more people, we need energy. In America, we would need at least 100 new nuclear power plants to kind of supply that. That's in alignment with lots of use of coal, natural gas, certainly crude oil, if we can hopefully deplete that, and all the imaginable renewables at the same time. Uh, uh, we are not going to put in 100 new nuclear power plants. We have a problem that's called NIMBY, not in my backyard. We have this fear prompted from Hiroshima, uh, recast again in Three Mile Island, Chernobyl, and more recently in Fukushima. It seems that we just don't believe in this energy source. It's, a, it's, it's unfortunate because it's one of the few things that doesn't carbon load the atmosphere, which is that is what's truly killing us. It's in a much slower effect to the tune of about uh, seven gigatons a year. We don't know what that means because we can't see it, we can't connect to it, it's not as obvious, but, and we don't necessarily uh, believe the scientists, since when do we ever ask scientists whether we want to believe them or not? I mean, I guess you could, but they're, they're trying to situate themselves uh, in, in the realm of facts. Uh, I also quoted Speth before, the dean of the School of Forestry at Yale, where he pointed out there were uh, um, something like 638 uh, scientific peer-reviewed papers that said without a shadow of a doubt climate change was man-induced. There were zero counter papers published in any of the significant peer-reviewed journals. So that, that was slightly scary on um, one respect because it's not often that you find such a vast group of men and women in science in complete agreement. In fact, it's, it's actually not healthy. You would need uh, many layers of criticism but it's, it seems that the criticism has been internal, has been vetted, and is peer-reviewed, and simply can't find any alternative to what's happening to um, the atmosphere. So that being said, what would we do if we wanted to start uh, Civilization 2.0? Do we wait for this crisis? What would be the size and the scale of the crisis? Uh, was this crisis, for instance, effective at all? I, I'm sure you remember it was about, uh, I guess, two years ago now, the Gulf oil spill. It was just the, the kind of Satan's vomit pouring out into the Gulf, tons of crude oil by BP. And uh, you know, I, I was at the Aspen Institute where we were with um, a number of folks, Shell and uh, uh, cabinet members, uh, congressional members, and a lot of scientists and thinkers about what we can do about the spill. Uh, and National Geographic's actually objective wasn't really to think about the spill so much, but to record its effects to register the damage and make sure that it gets into the eyes of the, the, tip, the everyday person who doesn't care, someone like Homer. Because if somehow you can make a connection to him, maybe we can avoid something like this in the future. And if you can think really hard what some of those images are from this particular um, incident, and I, you know, as an architect, I, I pull in a lot of work that's about visual acuity. Uh, we, we didn't really hit it, or at least National Geographic didn't. I mean, there was, there was some dead birds, certainly some, a few megafauna, some fish, uh, uh, you know, some, some undersea shots that were very uh, distorted of the spill itself, but, but nothing that really hammered home a true crisis, and certainly no dead humans 
for besides the people that died on the, the horizon, the, the drill itself. There just wasn't enough to think that this was uh, a kind of a, the event that we're looking for for uh, where we would get change. Now, I better say this because it, it sounds like I'm, I'm looking for the end of the world and, there, and, and that if a lot of people die, we can get to the next civilization. Uh, that, that's not exactly the case. Um, I mean, I, I think that it, it's going to happen, something like that, uh, we can't just continue to grow and grow and grow and grow with no consequence. Uh, and what it might be would most likely be something economic. Uh, and, and maybe if, we, if everyone loses a lot of money, we can retool our civilization to the 2.0 and start getting into those texts that describe exactly what we need to do to live in harmony or have some kind of understanding of the Earth's metabolism and have a society that fits to it. So I, I, I think that... Uh, um, what it might be, I, I, I don't know. I'm not a clairvoyant. Uh, I, I'm, I think maybe something that a little bit more gentle would be okay, but you never know. We talked today about um, the, 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 the volcano that cast this huge uh, ash cloud, also a few years back, which stopped air traffic control for a number of days. So suddenly we had one major industry uh, uh, kind of ended, and the world confronting itself from, a, from a, a natural disaster of sorts that harmed no one. And th that was, that's almost like a belch or a warning from, not God, but, you know, if we can use God in another sense, saying that, hey, this is the earth. It can wipe us out in a second. Uh, we certainly could stop everything, all forms of transportation as you know it. Uh, you're staring at one another. Maybe you want to realize that you have achieved what is called the state of globality. Uh, globality meaning this kind of theory that globalization is just a, a, a game of sorts. It is a process and it has an end. So it doesn't just exist forever, but globality has very specific, uh, or globalization has a very specific end point. That being uh, something like um, you're, you're in competition with everyone for everything, everywhere, all of the time. You're not separated by nation states or by geopolitical borders or by distance. You're all in this superorganism. It is one uh, contiguous planet. So if you push a button in one place, another button gets set off elsewhere. Some great examples of, of globality that's already in uh, kind of in existence is the financial markets. If the Japanese have a major uh, a peak, we see the results in New York. If something suffers in Sydney, we see the results in Beijing. The financial markets are definitely networked and entangled to the point where they are truly globality. It is very hard to find a firewall in that system. Uh, you know, maybe the Swiss can probably have done that. But, it, but other than that, there's, uh, it is definitely fully connected. So uh, what else might be globality is certainly issues of the environment. We just choose to not, rec uh, not to recognize it uh, specifically. Um, so I'm going to show some quick work that uh, we've been doing, that are kind of a, uh, a large-scale thoughts and also small thoughts, inventions that are open sourced, that are either DIY or available for anyone uh, in our nonprofit uh, Terraform, a Terraform one in Brooklyn. That uh, We put this work out there in, in hopes that, one, we will have a kind of a continuous dialogue with others doing similar work, uh, two, to kind of uh, you know create a polemic and argue over its merits. I think this is the you know the EGS. It's every time I give a talk here actually, and I've remembered this, and I'm, I'm sure in year three, same thing's going to happen. But it always ends where someone uh, really hits me with some uh, very strong not criticism, but but a deep query and some and some tough comments. Uh, and you know, I give talks everywhere all the time as much as possible, and I, I never get them. You know, the questions here get to be pretty rough. So I'm, I'm going to say right off the bat what we don't do so, so we can avoid some of those questions. Um, uh, and I, I think this should be fair. But we, we cannot, there's nothing wrong with helping starving children as a, a kind of a point. Uh, in fact, we probably should. Uh, for me, the conversation kind of stops when we get to that. Uh, as architects and urban designers and technological thinkers, we certainly would like to see a world where there's no such thing as malnutrition, but that's not something that's on our specific agenda. And there's probably a number of uh, other things that would not fit. So if we can kind of uh, look at the, the systems that I'm setting up and maybe, uh, maybe hit the arguments at that point, then that would be great. Um, for instance, this one, this image, I, I know, uh, uh, you know, sends off a number of sparks, uh, and I will, my caveat is it's exactly not my fault, 
but it was, uh, you know, it was the cover of Popular Science. I was super excited, uh, worked deeply with the editor-in-chief for some time, but the uh, image is, is just a little, is a little bit too much for what I think uh, possibilities of the future should or should not be. But the overall point of an image like this is to discuss what the future of cities might be, especially with green tech, especially dealing with different uh, kinds of mobility. So here, blimps and jetpacks and facades or fenestration systems that have uh, a kind of smart or performative structures inside them uh, certainly fit into our work. And I kind of talk about it a lot. So I'm going to go through this uh, uh, really quick. But at MIT, we were responsible for designing the car of the future. It's a really anachronistic statement. So we didn't want to make a car of the future, especially if it had big fins or something silly. So we worked on redesigning the wheel, one of, I guess one of our not MIT's, but all of humans' in, uh, inventions. So we designed the car to fit inside the wheel. Drivetrain, suspension, motoring, a modicum of intelligence. You add three to four wheels together, and you get a car. The wheels talk to one another. They communicate together on the city. They move in flocks and herds of other wheels, and, it's, and you get a system that's uh, much different than we see today. This is um, one of my greatest designs called the blank. Uh, let's see. Is that, oh, there we go. Uh, this is what we, we got invention of the year for Time Magazine. This is uh, a vehicle that um, is called a city car. The premise here is that cities have been designed around automobiles for a century. Finally, we need to make an automobile that fits the city. This context is for moving in downtown cores. The vehicle is designed to be parked because cars don't move most of the time. Actually, 85% of the time they're parked. They interlock like shopping carts. The frame stands up. It articulates. It's got swarm lithium-ion batteries inside the seating and the chassis. It's a kind of a Facebook on wheels. It's a shared ownership model, so you don't own it privately, but it's part pri private and public, like Zipcar, and you buy into it like a utility. You can take any car in the stack because the stack separates, so you can take the one in the middle if you need to. And you could fit about 300 and some odd cars on a New York City block as opposed to 34 SUVs. Americans love their Hummers. This one is looking at omnidirectionality in the same wheel systems. So this car does O turns inst instead of a U turn, spins on a dime, so it can explore the city in a new way. This vehicle is a paradigm shift in how we think about the material of cars everywhere. Since Henry Ford, we've been making cars out of shiny, precious metal. It's always these clunky metal objects. So here's a vehicle that's soft, made out of ETFE foil quilts or air bladders or starch foams, but the entire car is soft. So that was a kind of a, a, a break from thinking. Uh, different sponsors that we had here is Reebok, who want to get into the, the soft car business. So here is the shoe car, this kind of a sexy zipper to get in and out of your car. And then finally, the kind of the hug and kiss lamb car. This, this uh, concept is probably something you'd be fired for if you were an engineer working for a big corporate office coming in saying, I you know, had a dream, uh, no one should ever die in a car accident again, they should be soft, cushy-like vehicles, and, and you know, the idea is to constantly move in a flock and gently rub up against one another. You, you know, you're fired. Uh, you go back to working on your door detail, something like this. Well, this is a car that is so lightweight, doesn't move faster than 30, 35 miles an hour. Uh, it's essentially a beach ball on wheels. If it hits your sister, it would tickle her, not kill her. They would be phased into cities with big, precious, shiny metal boxes like Hummers. They would find something like that, these, these smart, soft, uh, hug-and-kiss lamb cars, and they would cluster around a Hummer and push it off the side of the road as they kind of take over the city. Here's a smart car, a vehicle clearly designed from the vantage point of being parked, the same kind of concepts we've been working on, except for here, the two wheels married together, the vehicle stands up, and we're smarter than a European car, which, uh, sorry, smaller than a European car, which is fantastic. You can also egress directly into the uh, sidewalk instead of getting off into the street. And then this is a kind of a, uh, we had a longer discussion about this today, but this was, this is where it's not about automobiles. I'm kind of done talking about the car. This is when uh, we had realized that these were very big, uh, intelligent batteries on wheels. We can have a new kind of an electric system that would engage the city and load or absorb peak demands on the fly. So now we are truly integrating mobility with a new electric system. We want to source it from renewables as much as possible. That would be the goal, but certainly not uh, use, use the systems that we have in t today with these decaying old plants delivering miles and miles of cable to get electricity to a point where there's millions of people. So we want to deal with its generation and a swappable or a switch fabric right there in the direct context where people are living. However, after doing this work about uh, 
a few months ago, there was a paper, a scientific paper released by the NRDC and a few other folks with a pretty much unforgettable name. So it, the paper was entitled um, Stab the electric, car, the electric Car in the Heart with a Stake and Bury It Forever. Uh, bury its corpse forever. And the reason for that was, and some of you may be aware of, is that, um, it's a good title, uh, uh, the, the, the amount of rare earth metals in producing batteries for vehicles like this, over 50 different rare earth metals actually, uh, not all of them are needed, but certainly lithium being the most popular one, are not accessible. So if most of them are in China, 97% of them, but even if we found all the rare earth metals, and we're still 20 years out from finding more of them, there'd be less than a fraction of a milligram per person on Earth. While we can measure uh, oil, crude oil, per person on Earth in kilotons, or at least uh, 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 large amounts that seem to never go away. So the idea that we're going to use batteries is probably n not going to be as logical as you think. We'll probably have to build in wire systems in the meantime until we can perfect new technologies of batteries. It still doesn't mean we can't use electricity, but the battery, I think, is going to be very, very difficult. So these fantasies you might have of Priuses dominating the planet Earth aren't very realistic until we can figure out how to make batteries in another fashion. This is the Prime Minister of the European Union sitting in one of our cars that we manufactured uh, just was released a few months ago as well. Uh, is also another official from the Basque countryside. These vehicles that stand up and are all electric are uh, actually made with Korean money, uh, MIT ingenuity, and, uh, and, and produced in Spain. So I don't know how all those forces came together, but uh, there they are, and these are one of the vehicles that uh, were presented recently. Uh, other concepts, I'll go through them quickly, are not about cars, but the, uh, these are this, this idea of uh, using blimps as a mobility system every day uh, in the city of New York, slow-moving blimp bumper buses at about 13 miles an hour. You hop on, hop off on these tendrils and ski lift-like chairs. Here are all the systems kind of coming together in an, uh, kind of a theory of soft mobs, excuse me, in smart dots, privileging this right down here, which is bicycles, great technology, so we don't need all these kinds of funk and functionalism devices, or the other thing which is uh, the, the, the pedestrian. Probably the best way to explore a city is on foot. Uh, other, other ideas about uh, bicycles here, recumbents, these are good for el older people or young people. They hold the bike speed record. They can have fairings or they have environmental kind of uh, uh, cocoons or uh, um, chassis around them, etc. They would move on rails and get you from A to B faster. You can get off them wherever you want. Concepts of the jetpack. Um, this wouldn't be as scary if, uh, if you, well, let me, let me put it in a context. About 150 years ago, Otis was presenting the elevator, one of the world expositions. And the elevator seemed like a very scary thing back then. People thought it was absurd, it was dangerous, it might have been medieval, whatever the case, no one was going to use an elevator. Well, what he had introduced was the safety brake to make sure that no one would ever die in an elevator accident again. To this day, no one has died in an elevator accident due to elevators falling because their cables snapped and they careened down a shaft. Despite what Hollywood tells you, that's not how it happens. You could die if the, you know, the, the elevator wasn't there and the doors accidentally opened and you dropped into the shaft, but he made them perfectly safe. Elevators were a technology that changed the base morphology of cities. Certainly gave us the skyscraper. The jetpack is also something that's just as promising. You can buy one for about $100,000. Martin Jetpack makes a version. Other versions use uh, hydrogen peroxide to move them. Uh, the same systems we use for the cars, lightweight, scuffable, can bounce into one another, move very slowly, but yet you'll get to your destination faster because you fly like the crow. Here for long, long, longer ranges, we have them attached to sky tugs so they can go longer distances. Uh, some other very new devices that also have enormous potentials for how we affect or change the city or think about the city, nano quadcopters. Uh, for those of you who don't know or haven't been on various uh, techno technology websites, these were all the rage and probably still are. They move in a kind of choreography in relationship to one another. They're, kind of, they're helicopters that move in 3D space, highly accurate, can swarm directly into this room through that window in a kind of a, in a Nazi-like pattern and disseminate throughout the room above each one of our heads and play music, uh, you know, drop a bomb, uh, you know, tell us about traffic patterns. Uh, unbelievably easy to program, capable of using an app to kind of manipulate them. Could do things like today, which was a great suggestion, uh, deliver packages. So imagine FedEx, where you sign a document, you hand it to a quadcopter and it puts it in its mouth 
flies away and you get it delivered within 45 minutes instead of next day. So quadcopters are really cheap, they're really fast, and they're becoming more and more ubiquitous. They were illegal in America until recently, until Obama established a law saying they're perfectly fine. And they're all different types. Uh, I subscribe to Aerospace Magazine, so if you're not into the high tech, I'm definitely into the low tech too. Uh, this is a cluster ballooning, so you can definitely go where you need to go in a, in a kind of an old school fashion as long as the wind is blowing in the same, uh, the same line of desire. <laughs> Uh, other projects, the Fab Tree Hab, this is looking at architecture and its effect on uh, the ecosystem. Here is rethinking uh, using a technique that's 2,500 years old. It's called pleaching or grafting inosculate matter to one contiguous vascular system of plants or woody plants, vines, semi epiphytic matter. This home is a part of the landscape. It's meant to have all kinds of critters on the outside birds, butterflies, uh, spiders, what have you, not termites. Termites don't eat. Uh, living trees, they eat dead trees. What it requires is maintenance like any other house. You need to use uh, uh, your eyes and make sure your home's okay. So you just need to change your filter of reason. Today we look to see if there's cracks in you know, 90 degree angles or we look at concrete and plaster. Here you need to be able to look at plants. You need to look at trees and have a deeper understanding of what a healthy one looks like and what one that's potentially sick. So it's a, it's a, it's a shift in our perspective and a, and a new connection to uh, the landscape. So here is a proposition for growing uh, thousands of these homes for thousands of families. Uh, it takes a modicum of time. I certainly know that. There's always someone that's very critical. Uh, I get a, curmudgeons everywhere telling me I don't want to wait seven to ten years for my, you know, my tree house. Uh, you know, this is just absurd. We have this, this culture of affluenza, this sense of immediacy, I need it now. You know what, if we wait 12 years for a bottle of scotch, I think we can wait 10 years for an entire village that fits into the ecosystem. And certainly use genetic modification. Paper companies are growing trees at radical rates. We use the precautionary principle and don't wish to do that. And then this is, this is some uh, uh, new slides of um, our bio lab. We had a lot of comments about grow, you know, being the veggie guys uh, for veggie homes. So why didn't we do something out of meat? Uh, slightly ironic, we took them seriously. My roommate at Harvard, Dr. Oliver Medvedek, went to the medical school, studied uh, cellular biology. Uh, we teamed up a few years ago and created our own molecular cell and synthetic biological laboratories in our architecture office. There's now seven biologists working full time. Kind of looks like this. Uh, uh, we do all sorts of projects that are really fun. One of the, the bigger pieces was this, um, was this concept of, of uh, winning the PETA prize or how can you use in vitro meat or tissue engineer uh, meat for human consumption. So a paper, this was a paper that Oliver's student did for Harvard, which was we modified an inkjet printer to print cells in a geometry. Anything you can stick in a syringe, you can print. You can certainly 3D print it. So it's a vastly different territory for thinking about design. Uh, it's a whole new world. In fact, it's, not, it's, it's what I call truly organic architecture. It's not your grandpa's version of organic architecture, which is Frank Lloyd Wright mimicking nature, using decorative elements in glass and steel and ideas and concepts about outdoors and saying it's organic architecture. This actually is taking systems in biology and fabricating. Biology is technology. Everything's been fabricated with biology. Your finger, your heart, your lungs, uh, it's in genes. If you've got scientists that know how to tweak genes and you've got architects that know how to tweak geometry, we can begin thinking about new kinds of substances and materials and, and products. So this is a bladder that is made to replace uh, uh, bladders in patients that have uh, prostate cancer. This is a proposition for a new kind of architecture called the meat house uh, or meat tectonics. Um, to explain this fully, uh, just a little side story about Louis Kahn, who was a great architect, uh, American architect, who only did 11 buildings but had 11 home runs for buildings. He would often talk, he would lecture, in fact every time he opened up his mouth he gave a dissertation. Uh, that's probably why we loved him so much, um, but he wouldn't let you leave. Uh, but he, that he would talk about what a brick wants to be. And he would hold up a brick and he would say, this was given to us by God. All cultures across the globe have used this as a unit of measure to build their homes, to build their societies. Bricks, no matter what the materials are, have a kind of essence. They have a desire. And you must ask yourself what the brick wants to be. Does it want to be a dome? Does it want to be an archway? Does it want to be a column. So when confronted with meat cells, 
uh, and asking the same questions on an architectural level, I could not find out what the meat wanted to be. Uh, in fact, I'm still not sure exactly what it wants to be, and those secrets are actually in uh, Evo Devo, or evolutionary development, specifically in the dominion of Hox, Hox genetics, and it's only 15 years old. So not even the scientists know what meat wants to be yet, although we do understand that at some point there's, uh, there is codes that tell you that your meat wants to form a finger and it's this long, or wants to form a ventricle in your heart, or wants to form a stomach. And, and, and we're just un unpacking those systems now. So here we, we did all these kinds of propositions for uh, printing uh, extracellular matrix from pigs and printing it to dye, which is another kind of crucial thing that separates us from Orin cats and others working in this field. Uh, they try and keep their, their structures alive. So they're printing uh, uh, biomass or, or uh, um, tissue uh, and trying to keep the thing alive. That is absurd. It has no immunological system, no skeletal system. It's not you have to have a contained atmosphere. It's not the point. Here what we're doing is we're growing these things to make things that die like leather or articulated swine leather so we're, we're not harming any sentient being. And it's all produced in vitro. So there's no petrochemicals used in the products. It's, there's no uh, creatures. It's just printing meat that turns into leather that can be used for handbags, belts, shoes, and ultimately geometries for building uh, components in homes, et cetera. And kind of the last few projects are at much larger scale. I've been moving from the, the scale of the wheel to the scale of the city. Here's something that I'm absolutely in love with. This is Wally. Wally is a nonstop uh, a kind of uh, Nebuchadnezzar. It's kind of this solar powered robot that's super cool, making cities of trash all day long because the human race has left us. If you ever want to connect with children about what we're doing to the environment, certainly show them Wally. It doesn't say much, it just shows you. Let's talk about techne versus poesis. Wally is the embodiment of the poesis. Uh, here we're kind of, we are taking some of ideas of Wally and using uh, trash as a uh, uh, a communication linkage to people showing them how much they produce in a particular week. So here is all of the e-waste in the city of Darmstadt in Germany. I got a whole group of students from TU Darmstadt and we're taking all the things that you find in your products from microwave ovens to stereos and speakers and washing machines. Uh, they actually filled up a room bigger than this and we built all these different kind of robots and deployed them throughout the city, these kinds of little uh, follies little architectonic sculptures with, our, with, with tags on them so people can find out more and communicated to folks how much waste they're making just in styrofoam. So we put them throughout the city in all kinds of funky places. This one was um, 38 feet in height. We used wood for the kind of the structure. And honestly, when you get a bunch of Germans together, they, they, there's some natural tendency to engineer things. So that this was, I, I had to let these guys go. Uh, this is in front of the museum. Uh, here uh, in the center square. This one is a, is a photo you cannot possibly make up. Uh, in about five minutes after these robots were deployed, the sanitation crew uh, in Darmstadt came out and this, this uh, 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 German garbage man just cycled our projects deciding whether it was art or trash or art or trash or, and about five minutes he decided it was trash. So there's a good critic for you. Uh, and we, we came out and said, no, no, it's about how much waste we produce and had a really interesting conversation with them and invited them to the opening and they showed up wearing those exact uh, outfits. Uh, these are off-the-shelf devices that every day deal with recycling and the waste that we produce, making dumb bales or bricks of waste. Uh, their jaws are only so intelligent to just produce that. This is plastics, cardboards, metals, etc. If we were to retool those jaws to make smart puzzle fitting geometries, so instead of a dumb brick, something that would be able to be assembled into any kind of a folly, we'd be able to communicate to Homer Simpson the amount of waste that we produce. So here is one hour in the city of New York. This is uh, the, the waste, uh, I think it's 36,000 tons of waste in New York. This is one hour's worth of it. In 24 hours, we produce a skyscraper. That's a 53 story building, which is the Commerce Bank, the tallest building in Europe every single day in the city of New York made out of compacted waste. So we produced this Wally tower as a kind of a communication, communications element. And then getting into the, the tectonics of this, how could it work, how could we actually realize this, and what are the different scales and the technologies available to us? So here's where we combine biology with uh, systems of upcycling, or aluminum 
that you see on the exterior that would be crushed into a specific geometry, and then uh, a, a, a form of a bio, a bio, make, a bio formation, which is mycelium, or root structures of mushrooms, or, or the waste material you find in landfills, and using them to also find geometry. Uh, we, did, we built these 3D Petri dishes that look like Tetris shapes that link together in three dimensions, and we grew our material uh, that you would find in landfills using mycelium that eats it alive and produced a new type of foam. Here is an example. We were commissioned for the New Museum of Contemporary Art, where we put on the facade of the building uh, uh, the, the, the projection, this projection of seven days of growth, uh, the exact same geometry. So here you see uh, the cellulosic structure or kind of uh, any, any kind of woody waste uh, being eaten by the mycelium or the strain of reishi. And it's actually so powerful it busts out of the welded plexiglass mold. Uh, and we had that projected for the Festival for the Ideas of Cities onto uh, the new museum, which was pretty cool. We, we, we made about uh, 14 of these models. It still kept on busting out. So here is a kind of a theory of a city where there is no waste. And what would that kind of look like? So here we're, we're thinking of a, a kind of a, a retrofitting mechanism. Uh, and maybe I can point this out. So here is, here is the cities we see today, a city produced on consumerism, a city produced on industry, and skyscrapers representing that exact power, the power of commercialism. And that's kind of what we look for in the center of our cities. And then eventually cities where this is the landfill or 36,000 tons of waste daily, eventually we mine the things that we throw out. Uh, if I was an alien species looking down at the planet Earth, I would think cities were invented to basically make landfills. Everything that we've ever created, anything, it ends up in a landfill. Whether it's a diamond ring or a newspaper, it's all there. So if we start to mine them and retool them and begin the process of retrofitting them to existing buildings or use in cities, eventually they get really good at it. And we have something where away, or the idea of throwing things away, disappears. Bertrand Stein said the best away has gone away. There is no place that you can throw things without confronting them. But we produce a city that's about creation to creation to creation, constantly designing and upscaling all the products that we use so that, that, that there is no waste, that there is nothing but a continuous nutrient stream. And this would be the last and possibly biggest interpretation of this work. This is looking at a, a, a city that is 100% self-sufficient, not only in waste, but in food, water, energy, mobility, air quality, all the things, all the stuff of life that make up our cities. And can we do it? Can we have an absolutely green city? What does that look like and what are the principles? And certainly we should begin the argument now. So we start with these very simple based, simple rules. Uh, in this case, there, there are many of these rules. This one's showing what we call a reversal of the figure ground. Here you see the traditional city. Now in 2000, we have some green spaces. And then in the future, we can expect some buildings to decay, and we can think about putting buildings in streets, kind of reversing the figure ground. And where buildings used to be, putting in something called productive green space. Not grass where you play frisbee, but productive green space. Green space that's accountable for either the making of food, is accountable for purifying of water, is accountable for air quality, etc so that we have a strange reversal and a curious one to remake the whole city based on a new mobility system that's fit into the buildings, buildings, and streets. And this is what it looks like. We take large uh, uh, scale equations, we cap the population here in Brooklyn and New York City at 9 million, and we start producing uh, a version of a city like this. Obviously, we're architects, so we're obsessed with drawings. I'll get into some of the details there later. But the big, the big strokes are thinking about um, condition that marries the city to its larger ecosystem, but there are no inputs or outputs. Everything is produced inside the city. So if I was to say, uh, well, if I was to be more exact in what that means, we would come up with the proposition of, can you run Manhattan on solar power, like a solar powered calculator? Can you do it? Sure. Sure you can do it. It costs about, uh, I think it was around $56 billion in 2006, 2007 funds. You would take uh, um, all of Staten Island and 18% of Brooklyn to be completely covered with photovoltaic cells, including batteries, running at 23% efficiency. And you'd have Manhattan and all of its energy needs running on nothing but sunlight. 
Of course, you wouldn't put it there in Brooklyn and Staten Island. We have 3,000 acres of unshaded roof space in our cities. We'd integrate those solar panels. And we'd also think about harvesting from uh, uh, water, uh, wave energy, sorry, geothermal and wind. So we have a much more robust uh, uh, energy system that can deal with intermittent cycles. Here, changing sections of Central Park so that we can start producing biofuels uh, as, as uh, uh, kind of a, another form of energy. This over here is the uh, Brooklyn Bridge that's been recast as a kind of pedestrian environment with high-speed transportation underneath it. Uh, here are some of the details of those areas. These models, and lots of them are uh, uh, kind of um, rather large, but it's it kind of we go to the water's edge where often the city confronts uh, a form of ecology, in this case, uh, liminal, liminal environments or liminology. So here we have an example where there is spaces shared between water and program for human use. And we think the future city cannot have stiff barriers or coffer-like dams that separates us from a kind of an aqueous environment. We actually should accept occasional flooding or allow flows to come into the peri-urban condition and take over some of our human use spaces for a while and then return. So one of the largest scales that we can work in is at the Brooklyn Navy Yard where we look specifically at dry docks as a conversion point between land and city allowing water to flow inside and to escape uh, again. Also thinking of new technologies that can go in there, uh, certainly different types of shipping or restorative ecology as a study center. Uh, here we have a, a large scale 3D printing uh, clean tech offices. Uh, this is a large scale 3D trash printer is one place to uh, explore it. Uh, this is a detail of the diagrid system that's cast over one of the highly efficient structural system over one of the um, clean tech buildings. This is a view of the overall of this uh, section of the Navy Yards. You can see here's some tugboats uh, for scale to give you an idea of what's uh, happening there. And then finally in this kind of last slide the theory for this city has to be absolutely clear. And that theory starts with a historical premise that the centers of cities hundreds of years ago were based on the idea that ecclesiastical structures or structures of spirituality or death is where humans began to kind of find densified environments. It's where humans started to kind of form the first city. So that's why you see so many early towns and cities centered around something like a cathedral as the center. Modern-day cities, zooming up a hundred, hundreds of years, are centered around something very different. It's not cathedrals, but it's maybe a new kind of cathedral. They're centered around skyscrapers, centered around tall buildings. They're centered around the meaning and power of the semiotic pulse of commerce. That's why everyone wants a glass and steel skyscraper, whether you're in Africa or Asia or Chicago. That seems to represent you are fighting and working in a contemporaneous era, and you are an economic might. Well, we're thinking the next image for the future city is going to be very different than glass and steel skyscrapers and certainly different than cathedrals. The new center for the new city will be the net, will be the net of infrastructure that keeps us alive and breathing every day. It will be the systems of water, food, waste, systems that move us around that will become the, the, the kind of the new locus point, the new spectacle. People will be proud of their infrastructure, not skyscrapers for commerce. And you can imagine every so often there would be a series of nodes in this net, something like this, not a church or a skyscraper, but celebrating a waste to energy plant as being the, the kind of the semiotic pulse for the new city. So this is kind of a, a summation of um, a lot of the work that I've been doing. And normally I can kind of stop here for some questions because I think it might be a good point. And then I do have a, a very small text to read, but I'm not sure whether we want to, you know, re if I read something together, you, uh, how that will kind of affect us and how tired you are. So I think it is a, a good kind of stopping point. So thanks very much. Good. Yes. I always call the scientists the enemies of mankind, but I, I cannot call you like this because you have such an ugly, ugly city I have never seen. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Is that recording? Yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. Not, uh, World Congress of Philosophy in 73 in Havana, which I uh, told the people about the radical critique of technology.
technology to Heidegger as a blue force for a new uh, society, you know, and for 20 years when you have been not even born yet, you know, I was there and <laughs> was so happy, a young, young philosopher who could tell the audiences, you either change fundamentally or you will die as a species. And I was so happy to show them the death coming after you because this kind of life or living cannot sustain. And that was beautiful. This is to have an ecological crisis you could throw back in there uh, as a kind of a not knife even. And, and this nuclear bomb, as I see Hiroshima, it was, it was a, a con game. If the Japanese had known that the Americans only had two bombs, <laughs> and not a third one, they would never have given up. And another 200,000 Americans would die, this, like we did it all with the wars. We have to kill the young boys this, uh, every 20 years. This, so the Third World War was missing, unfortunately, the Cuba crisis, which was, he came near, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> the point is, I'm going to republish my work from 30 years ago. And we will, will not change anything, we will only interject the old Schumacher talking to the young Schumacher with a different type. So you can see it's the other one. And one of the reasons is that unfortunately, young. Schumacher, the ecological crisis had not the death quality you were hoping for. Mm. Because only the immediate threat of death would make Homer Simpson change. Yeah. Homer exactly. Simpson means the humans, they cannot be changed by education. They are idiots. That is their um, private person. You know, they couldn't care less about the public good to uh, the future as long as Today is fine and they are uh, happy. So education, this is the first thing you have to learn as an educator, doesn't make any difference. Mm. It only can clarify what you know already, what you feel already, the intuition you have already. Okay, there you can give, uh, thank you, you gave me quite a few uh, images I would have rather not seen. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought of it much better than this one, you know. <laughs> but no, but I can, I can see and you are really the uh, represent what and I will use your work for that. But old Schumacher will tell young Schumacher, you know, that the humans were at least so the idiots were at least so smart not to kill them themselves right away, but slowly. For some for example the River Rhein, you know, our mm. biggest river, that is Germany, the River Rhein. This, my time in 70s, in the 70s, you could not pass in the Rhine. There were no fish in the Rhine. There was not the Rhine was dead. Now, maybe you can still not go swimming. <laughs> but there are fishes back. Fishes you might not want to eat, but fishes you can fish it. So that's what, as an ecological crisis in the early 70s became so visible, is now has now gone underground. Has now gone underground and has become the finance sector. Has become this uh, kind of thing. Yeah. Is, is not has not the quality of crisis and death. In it. Look at the banker, they get millions uh, <laughs> back. And it, it, this, like, it never happened. And stupid Ob Obama, another idiot, you know, uh, in Abital sense, you know, like a sacred idiot, somebody who means well but cannot fight good enough uh, for it. Uh, he will be, with Romney will come in now, you know, and then you see much clearer. What the structure is totally right about today's uh, mm. structure is. But don't worry, first thing, you will be dead anyway for <laughs> anything of that. I am the dead first, you know, <laughs> and I will be just ashes in the ocean. So it is not, not even ashes after a few 
minutes, I will not even be ashes anymore. So it is a something old Shomara tells the young Shomara that <laughs> your hope that the crisis, the death threat, will end up or will incite a profound change mm. was you are very fooling yourself. You are still anthropocentric. You are still believing that you that human being has the responsibility and the power to change all the world. In fact, you are just anthropomorph. You are, no, you are not godlike or nature-like or anything. You are just a human being which goes very, very slowly. That changes will take a billion, not no, okay, and I like tonight, a million years to, <laughs> to really make a difference. Hmm. And at the, six, at that time I was a pessimist, you know, I was in UP, now I'm screwed by the American way of life uh, for the last <laughs> 30 years. Now I'm an optimist, I'm really an optimist, I really think that machine man, as I call uh -huh. Call it now. Uh, this is the one part of us which likes to work, which, which uh, will allow us to take over the everyday uh, garbage collecting, etc. And this kind of technology which has no goal except of uh, functioning itself will allow us to be children like you as a kindergarten project. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's a wonderful kindergarten. Be happy. All the good scientists. Nick, these eyes are saying help. No. <laughs> <laughs> Another Mr. Feigenbaum. Do you know him? <laughs> Rockefeller. Um, no, no. He was the, okay. the Mozart of uh, chaos theory. Okay. Uh, uh, Glick? Feigenbaum. Oh, I thought James Glick. Okay. No, no. Okay. He, that is generations uh, okay. and the guy who just finished high school in England and then became professor at Rockefeller University mm. in uh, New York also to show you what kind of uh, guy is. He displayed to me that and told me that I'm wrong when I accuse the scientists of being enemies of mankind. They are only the directors writing the proposals for getting grants and things like that. The out, the, the built out scientists. The real scientists are like children. Because yeah. you have this kind of, in so far, yeah. it was not so wrong to invite you together with teachers, spooky, I, I think. That's also <laughs> a kind of playful, child, child-like, but a child of a second, uh, Generation, you are not the innocent child. You are the child who went through all the uh, other things, but you came out as a kind of innocent child, second innocent, is saying, "Oh, but there is a there are possibilities, genetic possibilities." You are not uh, because you don't remember, but you can read it. The uh, genetic engineering is a challenge uh, to. Humanity in the beginning, nicht, that it was idiots like Crick and other Nobel Prize winners. Watson, it, yeah. Watson, it, they came up with this idea of three arms and, and etc. for people who want to fly into space and also, also making a total instrumental technology stuff. Hmm. Nicht, making really tool. When you say read retooling now, nicht, I don't hear the cut in there. Retooling is like a Kids uh, asking for more tools, more more toys, actually, mm. to play. And your toys are serious toys. Also I'm totally mm. aware of, uh, of that. And it shows something I totally underestimated as a young man. I underestimated the adaptability of the human species. Mm. Also the humans, they can take a lot. Yeah. Nicht? And what you are talking about mm. Hiroshima, Dresden, nicht? the Americans tried to kill me uh, uh, there and, and killed 200,000 people, but I get, got out of it uh, with the last train, nicht? unfortunately for the Americans. <laughs> <laughs> I came to mis mislead their youth. Their youth. Huh? Yeah. Anyway, I don't, it's 
the death uh, toll of it is not really the problem. I don't think that since 9 billion are uh, a crisis uh, in which you can invoke death. It will invoke a lot of bad living. And people yeah. will try to, to turn this around and, and yeah. into a good living. They want yeah. a Mercedes, they want a Google car, you know, they want um, something of, of that, and they will find a lot of things <coughs> you do with genetic on, uh, biology. I'm totally sure that all this will happen, but will happen in a, in a playful way. It will not happen yeah. with the whip of, uh, or the threat of death. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah. Behind it, yeah. so it is. Look, our what we are capable of. Yes? We will really, we will enjoy this kind of things. So it is not Homer Simpson which is really interesting. So then certainly Bart Simpson, you know, <laughs> <laughs> is the right one <laughs> to to address and to and to play with. That is uh, the future. That is has always been. <laughs> The only thing you really have to deal with, and you will not know before you will turn 60 or so, uh, maybe 70, 80, 90, uh, that everything goes so much slower than you thought. But everything important, but that's mm. and this uh, technology is uh, going on in a very fast uh, space. But this is for uh, human living style, still very slow. What is an iPod? And, you know, this is just things uh, you have done before in, in several ways, in one day, together, and immediately, etc. But the content is the same stupid thing uh, as it always was, you know, it's you, your friends, this, your porno, whatever you, you enjoy. <laughs> and, and don't look at me, I have the right as a founder to speak for 20 <laughs> we were on okay, Porto, I think we did. Yeah. I think no one could have ever imagined the Orwellian future, the kind of George Orwell's uh, 1984 prediction, to find any level of success. It just seemed that the notion of Big Brother uh, becoming real to the extent that it has was not something that we, we were, were, were able to predict. No one could have possibly thought that we would freely give out uh, knowledge about where we're located, who our friends are, uh, where we have been. Uh, and all kinds of uh, connections that we have to families and business and put that out there for the public to see or any government official. So something that, ha so it, Orwell did happen, but it, it was kind of through the conduit of Zuckerberg and something like Facebook and through the, through the act of play and innocence and, and kind of openness. So, so, so I do think that, I, I'm obvious, I uh, should reassert it, I, I, do think, I don't think a centralized authority is going to produce that. I think it's going to be a combination of top-down and bottom-up. What does need some level of understanding is the picture. Uh, not a picture of utopia, although I don't think utopia is wrong. Utopia is actually an, a maximal answer to a real-world problem. It's, it's uh, you know, I, I said this before in class, it's, it's like going to the gym and not having a goal about what a perfect body is like. You may not want to be Arnold Schwarzenegger, but you definitely need to know and understand what healthy is. So it becomes a kind of a map to where you need to go. Uh, Chicago had a, had a very simple meme, and that was called the City Beautiful. There, Ebenezer Howard had an England called Garden City, 
uh, and there's many other examples, but these memes allowed for the production and building of places like Chicago or uh, 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 you know, many other cities, San Francisco, what have you, because they were just everyone locked into the notion of, uh, you know, uh, Garden City, whatever that meant, it wasn't clear. As far as the scale of time of change, I think that's also a good question. And I think I, got, I, I, think I, my, I have a very cogent kind of um, position on that. And that is that it depends on the different levels of technology and, and the kind of the scale of how they affect uh, the society. So something like telecommunications, where, you know, iPods, where we can get our porn or communicate with our friends in the exact same old way that we do, this uh, conceptually took about five to seven years before it went from a sketch on a napkin to uh, an object that was purchasable anywhere in, in the world. So telecommunications and systems like it uh, are, are, very, are, are quicker in pace to change. Uh, things like um, automobiles or new types of trains take a lot longer. So for a car, uh, it takes about 15 to 20 years before you have a concept of a, of a Prius and before you can buy an actual Prius and before they're produced. And, and it's nothing that deep. We've had electric cars since the very beginning. It just takes a certain amount of time because of the scale of economy. Architecture takes about 20 to 40 years, much different than, than telecommunication devices or vehicles. Because people buy windows, they have roofs, they have water heaters and they want them to last forever. And I think the city itself, which is the argument that I kind of ended up with, that takes about 100 to 150 years before we can even see those, those kinds of changes. From a thought, a magical thought about a garden city or a magical thought about city beautiful and whatever that might be, it took a lot of people arguing a very long time so you can kind of culminate one of these physical events. But yeah, I, I think there should be the, the directive or those principles set up now, and they have been set up, uh, that actually occur from generation to generation, positioning themselves and in also in opposition, arguing about the, what the new philosophy of the city might be. In this case, uh, you know, we, we are beginning yet another argument, which is the case for ecological urbanism or landscape urbanism as being the, the center of new cities. And I definitely agree it would be Bart Simpson's fight, not Homer's fight, because he's the one that's inheriting uh, that city in that place. <laughs> and the reason actually why always never happens is because it cannot do anything to you anymore. You know, when you 20 years or 30 years ago you would show a porno in a, in a classroom, they would fire you. I had to do it in fast forwards at the new school and claim later only people who know what is happening there would know. Every innocent person would not know that. Today there are no authorities who can really punish you, except you, right? you take drugs and federal, but that is one of the great, um, yeah, bad things, right? stupid things, what they do is kind of uh, yeah, employment program for officers. No? <laughs> and nothing else. Okay, Mr. Wood first. Yeah. Um, I'm not an architect, and I, I failed chemistry, and uh, my, level, my understanding of biology doesn't really surpass what they've shown uh, 
TV. Um, I don't expect to get good at any of these things in the future either. I'm going to develop my skills as a rhetorician and um, mm -hmm. an interpreter of texts, um, maybe a generator of one. And at the same time, I, I am persuaded in a lot of ways by, by the things that I see that you presented. Um, except on a sort of general level, as a young person, the trajectory of the future that we all are all responsible for. I was wondering if you could circumscribe for me in what you see as the task of philosophy, rhetoric, interpretation, people with skills like the ones I have um, in the realization of a Brooklyn that looks like this or um, a car that fold up. Um, what's the task of philosophy? Um, yeah, okay, so I never thought of that till this very moment. Uh, so I guess that would be a really good question. Uh, I, I might say at first, my first impulse would be the task would be no different than anybody else's task in a community, which is, uh, um, you know, not, not everyone has the time to think up of a new system for a city or a new uh, kind of uh, neighborhood or, a new, or how a new technology might affect them. It's not necessarily their job. So whether you're someone that's in rhetoric or philosophy or you're a fireman or a, plum, a plumber or, uh, you know, um, an, a, an educator, you don't necessarily work in that field. So I guess it's up to me, I guess the, the design universe, to start uh, sending out its position as the first signal of human intention, as a kind of our, our first directive. And it's done in a way that's uh, operable and physical. And, and, and then those become points of uh, argumentation, almost instant. Because you can look at a car that stands up and whatever judgments you make are absolutely fair. Any kind of criticism that you can possibly suppose on a vehicle like that is absolutely fair. Uh, and, and in fact, if, if anything, not to criticize it would be a shame. Uh, it, uh, to not to think about where it could damage or hurt or harm others, whatever it may be, uh, would, would be absolutely wrong. So I think probably the first and foremost thing that one could do is to probably be very critical of those things. And if anything, offer, instead of being just critical, offer a kind of a salient positive alternative. Say, so like, well, maybe if it was stackable and soft or something else or didn't run on electricity, uh, it ran on uh, fuel cell. Or, 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 or if you wanted to get the word out to others, um, which I think was your statement, uh, maybe think about what 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 would be the new direction for uh, society uh, um, living in a in a in a sense of harmony that we're probably never going to get to in our lifetimes? I do think that's okay. If I was going to bring up a, a similar philosopher, uh, Paul, uh, how do you say, Viorelli, Viorello, Virilio, sorry, uh, his, he often talked about technologies affecting uh, society in, in a much more specific way, kind of an accident culture. So if I was here presenting you an airplane that would hold a thousand passengers. That would be a new promissory technology. At the same time, it promises a thousand deaths. So there's always a twofold answer. So you get into an emergency system where you have to kind of uh, think about the, the kind of complicated world and rules that you've made when you propose new concepts or enter new ideas into the existing system. So I think it's uh, from a philosophical point of view, you can you can engage the dark side to to uh, kind of uh, reproach or reposition the, the the light side, which is the promise that technology might save us. On, on, on the idea of technology, just a quick note: uh, I'm, I'm certainly not a, a technotopic thinker, to full sense. I do think that there's to a high degree the uh, the ecotopic is a part of it. There are ways and traditions and the vernacular method of living in tune with nature or the metabolism of ecosystems that we can't just throw out. I mean, I think the treehouse project that I did shows that very clearly, using trees as they are and, and tweaking them. So it's, 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 I think it's ecotopia combined with technotopia. That, uh, even, they're all topias, but, but uh, there's a, a dual, duality between them. So that's exactly why you need philosophers. That is due to energy. And the artificial engine and the natural are not opposition at all. They are I different agree. Yeah. ways of human life techniques um, that is all. So and that is, we have yeah. uh, stopped this and even Virilio, this uh, 
one of our professors actually yeah. and they have been there and, and they have seen him what a great actor he actually is. You know, he, is, he, is he is playing on the to you, you know, it has many ways to to express what you wish for the world in other media and even the, the architect uh, uh, which we had here this crazy architect from uh, yeah, word, this word. right, right, who uh, never, never <laughs> did anything, but but had uh, draw a lot of buildings and uh, etc. Which really inspired other who built things. Uh, uh, think certainly somebody paid for that was the reason. And they could have given him some money then. Okay. okay, I know, I know. I go a little bit uh, around. Yes, please. Hi, uh, thanks for the talk. Uh, can you stand up so we always uh, can see and hear you better? Thanks for the talk. Uh, I just maybe you can comment on a couple of sort of assumptions that I thought were a bit odd. Mm -hmm. well, and one sort of, you know, that America is going to own Brooklyn in 100 years' time. You're totally right. <laughs> Actually, it's it's Russia. Yeah. They bought the, the the sports team. The Brooklyn Nets are owned by that Russian oil mogul. Okay. So, I mean, the sort of flip side of that is that you know I'm not I'm not really sure about this convincing sort of Western world that that is the U.S. democratic mantra, and I think maybe today it's convincing, for example, that you know. Leadership that there's a crisis in the face. And maybe the one thing that they can be scared of is that they can be scared of the So you can link what you're talking about with the crisis of, of, uh, of, of the world, the green world, the inflation, that would be something that would be Yeah, um, I, uh, yep, good point. Um, I guess I choose to pick on Homer because I, I, I feel very comfortable picking on other Americans. I think that's, that's fair. Um, but I did mention the idea of globality, that there is a connection and a competition for everything, every, with everyone, everywhere. There's outsourcing, soon won't exist. Uh, China's also changing its ways. I also, but let me kind of address China. On some level, uh, for me, uh, I don't want to invoke the boogeyman. Uh, in the 80s, Japan was the boogeyman. Japan was smarter, faster, better technology, better economy. They were superior to us in every way. They had skyscrapers designed with jetpack ports because they were going to have jetpack cities. And we believed it. And I, I thought that it was just the American media and the kind of the Amer America, the American political machine that painted them as a boogeyman to kick our asses and up the ante in our economic uh, powers. I think China, on some level, not the same, but there is this instance that you, you have to admit they are the boogeyman for America right now. We just blame everything on these people that we don't know enough about. Most congressmen don't have passports. They, they haven't been to Europe, or let alone China. I, I have worked uh, in China, so I, I get it. I have seen it with my own eyes. It's, they're, they're magnificent. Uh, but I, I didn't want to kind of um, demonize someone as a, as a kind of a directive to fight against, whether or not that might be true and inflation would possibly become one of the root causes for change. I do think the crisis would be possibly and most likely economic in nature, and a part of that would be something from China. But I think the Chinese also have us as a boogeyman too. So that's the part of what their uh, kind of media and political machine is doing. So they're saying you've got to do it differently than the Americans. Yeah. So, so, so it's, a, it's a, the boogeyman... I don't want to get into boogeyman. I want to concentrate on but Homer, but I but this, I understand the point. Yes. Schmidt, our political thinker, huh, he said there is no politics without an uh, enemy. Yeah. You need yeah. an enemy. You need to make an enemy. If you have none, you create one. That is uh, certainly. But this is still the old dualistic uh, kind of thinking. We are for the next 50 years. Yes, Mr. Warwick. Thank you. Uh, uh, there's also things... I, I wouldn't want to live in that city, frankly, but that's a different issue. Uh, I find that kind of alienating place to live. I like to 
to go, I, I, where's the bagel shop? You know. <laughs> um, Every 10 feet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's all the city. That's just kind of monumental. <laughs> So it's a good question. I'll, I'll maybe I can bring up a couple of issues with Detroit. We our our office was asked to go to Detroit and help think it out of its uh, a kind of a, its crisis. Um, it's actually working um, on the shoulders of giants, some of the finest minds in planning and architecture, corporation and development have been operating on Detroit for decades, trying to figure out how to change Detroit for the better. Um, if you think way back, well, I, our, I'll tell you what our concept is in, in a minute, but if you think way back in the 70s uh, when Detroit was on, you know, nose diving in its decline, uh, there, was, there was, in popular culture, uh, there was all kinds of movies and statements about Detroit that built this negative image about the place. I do remember this one specific movie called Kentucky Fried yeah, Movie, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, which is some <laughs> karate movie. Yeah, it's okay. So in this film, the emperor starts a sa uh, at killing off the uh, the karate guys. I don't know what they're called, uh, but he at forces them to have their heads chopped off one after the other. And then there was a particularly bad guy that he decided not to chop off his head, but do something worse, send him to Detroit. <laughs> so this poor guy gets uh, pulled away. And as a kid, I you know I'd always remembered, gee, the worst thing that can happen to you is to go to Detroit. So. Um, <laughs> When we went to Detroit, we needed to put a mirror up to that community. It was hard to do that. And we need to say, okay, forget returning to your past glory. It's gone. And a lot of cities and a lot of places and a lot of uh, communities and groups dream of glory. They want to be the best city. Toronto is always obsessed with being the best city. We're talking like a Paris. No, Toronto is good. Toronto is a good city. And Canadians kind of learn that slowly. There's nothing wrong with instead of achieving greatness, your goal being good. Yeah. Just get to good. Yeah. So I think that's something that Detroit needed to first put a put a handle on. Is they're never going to be Paris. It's just it's and they're never going to be the old Detroit. And one of the things we wanted to do to start that was to um, well change its name. We decided that no, if, if you whenever you call it Detroit, basically no one's going to go in and buy anything or have anything to do with the place except for maybe. You know, level it. So that I think that was um, part of it. And they they agreed to changing the name as a scenario. Uh, nearby, uh, yes, yeah, Springfield. <laughs> there are other names. 
New Kiss City was the one we came up with. Okay. Yeah. Any more? Yes. Yeah. Um, I was just curious. This is a good question. Um, both of those you know, ideas and possibilities really scare me the idea of time and resources. But as I understand it, you know, we really don't have that much time. That in around 30 years, we're likely to see some major weather storms, extreme events that yeah. we have not anticipated before that are you know, widespread and far more detrimental than we've ever experienced. And we're also running out of resources. So like a city like this, I mean, what's it built out of? And aside from meat and trees, and where's the time frame for either one of those places? They both seem really temporary to me. Mm. And, uh, and you are complaining nine billion then come to Detroit, you know. <laughs> 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 so all these kinds of things will be totally unimportant. But it is it doesn't matter. It's like a newspaper. You read the newspaper, everything is from here and five days later <laughs> you are not remembering anything. And that is the forgetting yeah. and the and the Fooling yourself that you are important, and <laughs> now is really the important uh, thing. You know, is a part of the human condition, the part which let us survive even in bad times. That is, so far, it's, it's not a problem to be a fool. But you are a fool in, in thinking that Detroit is a Schrebergarten. Is, 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 Little gardens where you uh, grow your own food. But that is Germany, 1925. You know, but after the big inflation, <laughs> we came up with that. One. And they all believe that this is change in lifestyle. Not change in lifestyle. It was back to nature and all this stuff. Guys, has happened again and again and again oh, yes. uh, many times. Not saying there's so anything wrong with it, but saying don't believe so much. In. Just uh, what is Derrida once said, you know, I go to every demonstration of the left, but I don't believe in it. <laughs> that is a difference, you know. Nicht believing in it, which makes you a fundamentalist of any kind, you know, and all the uh, looking at China, at China, and everybody, everybody knows you Chinese guys. You have so many poor people in this country. Shanghai and Beijing is not China. You know, there are cities which uh, are a promise, but China is so weak because it has so many poor people. And they will not stay poor, they get really angry. Much more than Japan, the Japanese people are very civilized, they kill themselves. Do you know that most of the old Japanese today, how they uh, die is. Uh, Suicide. <laughs> that is their Japanese style, at least. You kill yourself, then you cannot earn your own living anymore. So, but I don't. Bogeymen, big powers, there it's, it's not the case. America is still the strongest of, uh, of all. The only problem is that the American politicians are the birth of the politicians in the world, you know, as I said, really, as you said, the, the Europe is for the socialists, you think it's like that. They have no idea what the outcome is. They say every time I come back from the border, the border guard asks me, how long have you been away? Three months? <laughs> they, they cannot be, uh, even think of uh, um, that is possible. Okay. More questions, yes. Uh, talking about a 150-year uh, thought, maybe even more. Um, let me go back a few centuries to French Enlightenment and Loger in the Primitive Hut. 
So here is a, a kind of a, a thinker that made some very simple drawings about, for lack of a better term, a, a kind of return to nature in architecture and an imagination that there would be uh, a blend of the two. And it only came through in text and drawing. But it, it was uh, so fascinating, that narrative stayed in the books, stayed in academia, became a part of our hearts and minds and imagination uh, until a few centuries later it influenced a young uh, architecture student to think about what Loger meant and what the technologies are of the day. Uh, you know, certainly um, the, cenotaph, the Cenotaph by Isaac Newton, by Boulay and others, and Levius Woods, a kind of a modern example, making impossible drawings that can't be computed or built today, but he's certainly a hero and his work will stay in paper form for many years, if not centuries, until others come along and think about how to kind of recreate those arguments or reposition them. I uh, absolutely am a, a, um, a, a proponent of historic preservation. Uh, I think that um, a, a, just in, in 150 plus years, bridges that are already 200 years old are going to need to be revamped. The, the, the systems that we'll move around in will be different, maybe vastly different. The Williamsburg Bridge is already collapsed in a middle section, just plopped out. So I don't know if uh, we'll be moving around in trucks in 150 years from now. In fact, I, I hope not. In fact, I would think the Williamsburg Bridge might become something that would be pedestrian much more so. In fact, large sections of it are today and explore the city in that routine. I mean, to us, we, we actually keep or preserve a lot of historic structures. Uh, in fact, uh, 33 to 40 percent of the buildings that we have are the same in, that, in those city plans, in these drawings. They're just boxes. But we do add occasional characteristics or some kind of definition or uh, a new form of building next to it, which is what we read. And so we see this as something that sticks out. And we don't notice the, the background information. But uh, I, I think that we are, you know, the intention is to certainly keep as much uh, building stock as possible and preserve it. But it, that I have to admit at some point um, uh, they, they will need adaptation. So uh, to me, form doesn't follow function. Form follows anything, so long as you're accountable for gravity and technology and light and air and views, etc. cetera. And that, and that there, there's, there's a constant shift in, in that interpretation as well. The only reason you are in, in Brooklyn is because you cannot afford Manhattan anymore. <laughs> I, <can't, laughs> I would not even call that in Brooklyn. <laughs> anyway. But Anyone yeah, from Brooklyn here? Is, you know, very honest, certainly. Now, good to hear that you allow them to uh, stay on. <laughs> oh, anyway. Thank you very much for your...